ان الحمد لله نحمده ونشكره ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فقد غوى حتى يفيء الى امر الله وانه لا يضر الا نفسه ولن يضر الله شيئا وقال الله عز من قائل اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد respect to listeners rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has encouraged us to recite surah al-kahf every friday In various hadith we learn of some of the virtues of reciting surah al-kahf on this holiest day of the week. In one narration it's mentioned that whoever recites surah al-kahf on a Friday Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a light for him that stretches from him all the way to the Kaaba. and in another narration a light that stretches from him all the way to the heavens and most importantly in many hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has informed us that whoever whoever recites surah al-kahf on a friday allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him from every fitna from every trial from every tribulation that may befall him from that day onwards for up to 7 or 10 days even though that fitna that tribulation that trial may be as great and as grave as the fitna of the jahl himself just raise the volume بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so as i was saying rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has encouraged us to recite surah al-kahf on a friday and he's mentioned all of these rewards now what's so special about surah al-kahf that each week in a ritual manner we have been encouraged to recite the surah obviously the contents of the surah have some special meaning and significance they must have a message the surah must have a message that is repeated to us every friday well surah al-kahf is a medium sized surah of the quran and it's difficult to summarize its contents but there are there are some themes that run through the surah For one the surah actually contains a number of famous stories one is the story of the young men of the cave after which the whole surah has been named another is the story of two men one who was extremely rich the other poor and the third story is of the prophet Musa alayhi salatu wassalam and his amazing encounter with another learned and pious servant of Allah Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu wassalam and finally there's the story of Dhul Qarnayn a mighty ruler and a pious servant of Allah azza wa jal here are four prominent and very famous stories that occupy a great portion of surah al-kahf and there's a common theme that runs through all of these stories and forms a major component of surah al-kahf 
And that theme is that the world around us, with all its glitter, its glamour, its power, its strength, is all meaningless compared to the hidden world of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a world of faith, a world of spirituality, a world of reliance, not on material things, but Allah Azza wa Jal. Let's take the first story, the story of the people of the cave. Without going into too much detail, this was a group of young men who were part of a, a very large society, going against the flow, bucking the trend. These few young men, who were so few in number that there were fewer than ten, one could count them on one's fingers. This group of young men, contrary to the rest of society, who were pagans and polytheists, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submitting themselves only to Allah azza wa jal, believing in Him, they worshipped Him and submitted themselves to Him. Obviously, since they were bucking the trend and going against the flow, swimming against the tide, and their beliefs and their practices were in utter contrast, stark contrast, to everyone around them, including their own family members. They faced hostility, enmity, and eventually persecution. And this persecution reached the stage of threats on their lives. Finally, they were given an ultimatum. You will either renounce your faith, or you will suffer death. These young men conferred between themselves and their conference has been mentioned in the Holy Quran that how can we, should we abandon our faith, should we renounce our belief in Allah, should we move away from, the, from worshipping Allah with Tawheed and with oneness to the worship of many gods and false deities. Should we move away and submit from submission to Allah Azza wa Jal to submission to everyone and everything else? And inevitably and without a shadow of doubt, they concluded that we will suffer the greatest loss if we did any of this. We cannot renounce our faith in Allah. We cannot renounce our belief in Allah. So what do they do? They felt that we cannot renounce our faith, but because of the persecution, and the threat of death, we must move away and go into hiding. So they fled. They fled from society. They fled from their loved ones. They fled from their family members, their lives. They fled with their faith and retreated into the mountains and worshipped Allah in secret. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously put them to sleep for more than 300 years. This is no legend or fable. This is mentioned quite categorically and unequivocally in Surah Al-Kahf, in the Holy Qur'an. After the passage of three centuries, and slightly more, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to rise. They didn't know that they had fallen asleep for so long. When they awoke and saw the position of the sun in the sky, they thought that this is just the passage of a few hours of the day. One of them descended very discreetly into the local community to purchase food for themselves and it's a long story eventually they were discovered because of their coins their manner of speaking their dress to be from an ancient time and not contemporaries as a result their story came to light and now times had changed what had happened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put them to sleep simply because they were too pure they were too good for their own time People weren't receptive to their message. People could not understand what they said. People thought they were mad. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen them. As a result, Allah azza wa jal allowed three centuries to pass, many generations to go by, before the people, their minds, their mentality, the climate, were all ready and receptive for them. And only then did Allah azza wa jal resurrect them and bring them back into the community so that now they could serve as light and beacons of light and guidance for everybody else. And they were hailed as heroes and they were granted honor both in life and after death. 
in summary, this was a story of the people of the cave. It's actually after this story that the whole surah has been named. The second story was, is of Surah Al-Kahf is of two men, both acquaintances. One was extremely rich, the other was poor. The rich man took his friend along with him for a tour of his estates and his property and wealth. And as he was marveling at his amassed wealth, he became boastful and arrogant. And he began saying to his friend, look at what I have. Look at these riches, this estate, this wealth, this honor, this wealth and power, fame, my children, my clan, my possessions. And as he was boasting, he actually began muttering something else. What he began to say is, do you know? I don't think that all of these riches, this estate, this wealth, will ever perish or expire. In fact, and then he progressed further. I don't think that there is ever going to be an hour of reckoning or a day of judgment. Then he progressed even further and he said, In fact, if I am returned to my Lord, I will discover even more and even better over there by Allah. And these verses, Allahu Akbar, this is the power and the eloquence of the Holy Quran. That in three sentences, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us of the corrupting, corrosive, and deluding nature of wealth. When man becomes wealthy, he becomes deluded. Wealth clouds his judgment. Wealth and riches place a veil before his eyes. They make his vision muddy and murky, and he can't see truth from falsehood, falsehood from truth. And just as this man was saying, he was boasting of his riches, and he eventually began saying that, do you know what, I think this wealth and this estate and these possessions and riches are everlasting, they will never expire. And then his delusion took him a stage further. Not only did he believe that his wealth won't expire and his possessions will never perish, he said, in fact, I don't believe that there is ever going to be an hour of reckoning, an hour of judgment. There is no life after death. There is no day of judgment. There is no hour of reckoning. And then his delusion took him even further. And he said, if perchance, if for argument's sake, there is a day of reckoning, then I actually believe that just as Allah has honored me in this world, Allah will honor me even more in the hereafter. Then his companion turned to him and said, why do you boast thus? Instead of boasting, and ascribing these riches and this, this wealth to yourself, why, don't, why aren't you grateful to Allah? Why don't you say, Masha Allah, wa la quwwata illa billah? Why aren't you, why don't, why aren't you humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And not only that, whilst boasting about his wealth and possessions, his arrogance led him to hold, hold his companion in contempt. And he actually turned to him and said, I am better than you. I am richer than you. I am wealthier than you. And I have more power and possession and control over people than you. I can summon greater numbers than you can. So the companion turned to him and said, If you think I am inferior to you in wealth and in numbers, then it is highly possible that my Lord may destroy all of this. And no sooner had he spoken than a thunderbolt struck his properties and his estate and his wealth from the heavens and burnt everything. The words of the Quran say he was left rubbing his hands in regret and in sorrow at what he beheld before him of the destruction of his wealth and property within a few moments. The third story is of Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salatu was salam. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam was a prophet of Allah who despite his knowledge and learning and his prominent position did not know certain things. And he correctly said about himself that he is the most knowledgeable person. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to correct him and say to him that you are the most knowledgeable amongst your people, but there, is, there are many things of the knowledge of Allah. There are many branches and disciplines of learning that you do have no access to, you do not know. 
Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said to Allah, O oh Allah, how can I find a way to this servant of yours who is more learned than I am? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him. It's a long story. Finally, when he met, when the Prophet of Allah, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, met with Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salam, they both went on a voyage. This voyage, this journey was, a, was an amazing experience for the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. He witnessed and saw many things that he, despite being a learned and wise prophet of Allah, could not understand, just could not fathom and comprehend. And on each occasion, he kept on interrupting, objecting, questioning, and he was told to remain silent and patient on each occasion. Finally, when, he, when the two could no longer keep company, they parted. But before they parted, Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salam explained to Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam the hidden meaning and the profound truth and the hidden wisdom in the laws in the in, and the decisions and actions and judgments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam despite being a prophet of Allah could not understand initially and then there's a full story of Dhul Qarnayn Dhul Qarnayn was an, was an emperor a mighty ruler who ruled over a huge area of land and over, over, had control of the lives of many people but the most amazing story the, the moral of this story of Sayyidina Dhul Qarnayn of Dhul Qarnayn is that despite his wealth, despite his power, despite his riches, his military might and his conquests, he was a humble servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was never deluded by wealth or most importantly by his military prowess and his strength and his power. These are in summary four stories of Surah Al-Kahf that form a major part of Surah Al-Kahf and What's the common theme that runs through all of them? It's this. Going back to the story of the young men of the cave. Look at how these young men, they withstood the pressure of wealth, of family, of power, of the whole of society, and bucking the trend, and with, withstanding all of this adverse pressure, these young men continue to believe and submit to and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite everything, despite all the difficulties and despite having to bear many hardships, despite all the struggle with conviction, with faith, with and struggling, they continued with their faith and their submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they saw beyond the wealth of their people. They saw beyond the love and the attachment of their own families. They saw beyond the power and the strength of their entire community and society. And withstanding all of this, they remained worshippers and sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, that young, those two men, whilst one was deluded by wealth, the, his companion was not bamboozled, nor was he blinded by the glitter of his companion's riches. But despite his poverty and his individual struggle and hardship, he remained firm in his faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Khidr and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam, their story tells us that even the Prophet of Allah initially on a few occasions he was also mistaken and he could not see beyond what was apparent because Allah kept it hidden from him but Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he himself eventually learned that there is a hidden world and a hidden dimension that he even as a prophet of Allah could not understand and could not see because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to veil it from him and these are just some of the lessons that this world around us is a world of materialism. And materialism isn't just the love of wealth. Materialism is an absolute belief in matter and anything which isn't. It doesn't matter and it doesn't exist. All that matters is matter, what you can feel. As a result of this materialism, people, we have become reliant and dependent on matter, on wealth, on what we see and feel and experience. Our vision has become limited only to this world and we fail to see beyond the glitter of gold, beyond these riches, beyond material possessions, beyond these few years of life on earth and we fail to see the greater wisdom and the greater universe and the 
other spiritual dimensions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's all about faith. This is where our faith comes in. This is where the teachings of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam come in. Even Dhul Qarnayn, Dhul Qarnayn, the false story, he had power, he had riches, he had military prowess, he had control of swathes of land and people's lives. But he, being a true servant of Allah, saw beyond all of this, and despite his wealth and power and riches, unlike the other one who was just who had a few meager possessions, he never became deluded. In all of these stories, we have a lesson of faith that will surmount materialism, of belief in spirituality that will free and liberate a person from the imprisonment of materialism and just this world. These are just some of the morals and lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to impart to us by a weekly reading, at least, of Surah Al-Kahf. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has encouraged us to recite and it's not just a question of recitation but also to reflect on and ponder over the meanings and the message of Surah Al-Kahf. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to continuously recite the Quran as much as possible and at least to follow this example of reciting Surah Al-Kahf for its reward as well as for the meaning and message every Friday. And may Allah make us amongst those who are enlightened by the message of Surah Al-Kahf and who are, able to, who are enabled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the tawfiq to actually apply these teachings in their practical daily lives. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.